How are you, Francisco? You're muted. I'm good, Arvin. Good morning. I, uh, are we are we already streaming live to the world, or are we? Uh, yes. we... We are streaming live to the world. Yeah, <laughs> we could uh, we could have some uh, conversations leading up to the ambassador joining us here in a few minutes. He is on, but I think we're he's connecting his audio, uh, which we're fine because we have we have uh, several minutes. Um, how are you doing? Uh, I'm wonderful. It's been an interesting time, uh, as it has for everyone, trying to stay connected to the work in the world. In the midst of all of this, uh, uh, all this, uh, they, they, they call it, hang on a second, let me get some light going. They call it uh, VUCA times, right? Volatile, unstable, uh, chaotic, and ambiguous. And so in, in the work uh, as, a, as a community uh, coach, facilitator, et cetera, in its own weird way, uh, the, the work is as busy as it's ever been because I think all of these these moments that we're going through and the, the important questions that it raises is really uh, causing everyone to dig into their own future plans and make sure that that they're really ready ready for the world. Well, you know, since we we are lucky enough to um, to be speaking with you right before the ambassador gets on, uh, you you run a coaching and strategy uh, business or organization of which you had. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, sure, I'll tell you, uh, we've been at it for about 13 years. Uh, my, my first decade of service was with the American Red Cross. Uh, I, I started with them in Denver, Colorado, got deployed to Puerto Rico and, and uh, grew up very quickly uh, with a, a month in uh, 1998 and Hurricane George working in the Central Highlands after Hurricane George. And then, uh, and then when I got back to the mainland, that turned into the next 10 years with the American Red Cross. And so the, the work with the Red Cross involved a lot of you know, large scale planning for hard to imagine things uh, you know, in, in sort of unpredictable timeframes. So when, uh, when the time came to, to step out of that life, because as you can imagine, a career in, in disaster relief. Oh, the ambassador's here with us. Wonderful. Good morning, Ambassador. Hi, Francisco. How are you? How are you? Wonderful to see you. Am I a bit early in the call? That's fine. That's fine. Hi, how are you? It's good to see you. You too, Ambassador. Uh, how, how is it going? How's the day going? Well, you know, we, we have no fire drills, so we're doing okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, great, great to be with you guys. Can I... Can I uh, are we alone in the call now? Because I have a, a question to both of you. We are streaming live, Mr. Ambassador. So okay. we're streaming live right now. That's the, um, the 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 unfortunate thing with trying to have an all-day event using Facebook Live is that uh, there are some programs which we haven't been able to update uh, with is to create rooms where you could chat. But we are live, so... Um, if this is about if this is about having Francisco and myself move to Belgium, to, <laughs> you know, I think we're in. We would happily accept the invitation, sir. Uh, no, uh, of course, of course, I will help you really well. You could type a message in the chat room. Yeah. Um, and we could start here in about. Four minutes, uh, if if that's okay. okay. Okay, I think I have to. I think I've lost you. Is that possible? No, we're here. I, we can. I can hear you and see you. Okay, but it's because I I try to. Um, okay, no. Excuse me, one second here. It's Bob Browback. Yeah. Yes. Okay, there we are again. And Mr. Ambassador, as we wait to get started, uh, the, the chat is available. So if you have that, that 
kind of background question for us. You're, you're welcome to type it yeah. to us. In the no, chat. No. Gonna... no, if, if during the, our conversation, um, <clears throat> you'll give me you give me two minutes to say something about the honorary consul who is going to introduce me. I think that shouldn't be a problem, but I'm going to say extremely, Wonderful. extremely nice things. Well, he's, I, I've gotten to know him in Rotary and he is uh, such a remarkable person. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. And, uh, introducing me to you and, and uh, also the ambassador to Namibia and, and really getting, uh, getting the city involved in um, in, in internationally, um, he's been he's been a true blessing for us. Absolutely. Are you in DC, Ambassador? Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm in DC. I'm at home, and uh, I I'm in my I think in my today it's eleven o'clock here Washington DC, and I think I'm in my sixth Zoom meeting already. Uh, <laughs> there were a couple of farewells. But uh, I've been looking forward to this one. Well, we have been too. Thank you so much. And we can get started as soon as Bob Bob is trying to log in. Yeah. Um, so as soon as he logs in, we could start. Um, I could actually uh, talk to Francis. I, I was going to introduce Francisco, and I could do that uh, anyway. Um, but I want to thank both of you for joining us. I want to thank the ambassador who has always generous with his time to visit when he's in person and also uh, speak to us virtually when he's when he's not in person. Uh, we had a really good time when he visited San Antonio and and uh, and I made a joke earlier about the fire drill. We were meeting at the San Antonio Area Foundation and uh, we have an hour and we have several different people from the community including Francisco, I think you were there. Um, uh, and uh, we had councilwomen and commissioners and, and World Affairs Council members. And then maybe 20 minutes into the meeting, we had fire alarms going on and uh, we were trying to take a picture. And I was adamant because I thought we wouldn't have the opportunity. And so we took a picture while the alarm is going on. And so we went to the parking lot and, and finished the meeting there. And he was kind enough to do that. And Mr. Alvarez came and he's like, what are you guys doing in the parking lot? <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Ambassador, for always, uh, not only for your service, but also for your uh, uh, generous time and giving that uh, to us here in San Antonio. We, everyone appreciates you um, and, and, and the, and the uh, respect and the time that you give us. So thank you so much. Um, I want to introduce Francisco. I've known Francisco for years. If you're in the nonprofit world, you definitely have heard his name. Um, I have always kept an eye on him just because he has spoken very highly of his ability to coach and strategize and help nonprofits succeed. And when I left Big Brothers Big Sisters, uh, I, uh, uh, I was very happy to see that he serves on the board of the World Affairs Council. And I was like, wow, you know how uh, this was totally meant to be. So um, Francisco is, uh, he's been involved. He's, he's got a, he not only has the, uh, uh, serves on the board, but he has a passion for the Marshall Fellows. He was a Marshall Fellow himself. Um, and, uh, and he's very passionate about that in his experiences living abroad and also making sure that we continue our efforts here in San Antonio, welcoming the fellows. And because of the circumstances we've been in, that hasn't, we haven't been able to do that, but we certainly will pick it up. So thank you for your leadership in making sure that the fellows program is top of mind, um, Francisco. Thank you, Aaron. And, and briefly, as, as we wait for Bob to join us, just uh, for those of you that, that might not be familiar, uh, the fellowship that Armin is talking about is a program that was established uh, out of the German Marshall Fund of the United States in 1972 uh, as a thank you for the Marshall Plan, uh, the United States' economic investment in the rebuilding of Europe. Uh, the German parliament endowed a foundation that would forever be committed to cultivating and maintaining strong transatlantic ties 
between the United States and the leadership of Europe. And, and so uh, every year, uh, about 50 or 60 European leaders get to come uh, take a policy tour of the United States and 50 American leaders get to take a policy tour of uh, Western Europe. And I had the good fortune in 2009 of getting to be an American Marshall Fellow. Uh, and I got to spend some wonderful time, Ambassador, in, in Brussels, meeting with many of your fine leaders uh, and getting to also tour uh, a lot of your incredible uh, cultural patrimony, as well as uh, visiting other global destinations like NATO headquarters and everything else like that. So, so Brussels and Belgium always hold a, a very dear place in my heart. Well, thank you so much, Francisco. I, I could return the compliments when it comes to my heart and your San Antonio, because uh, uh, I've never felt a better match uh, between, uh, let's say, my, uh, my inclination for diplomacy, but also um, business and trying to be a, a, a diplomatic entrepreneur or an entrepreneurial diplomat. <laughs> and uh, it has always been a pleasure to, um, to engage, to have a, a dialogue uh, with, with, uh, with, your, with the community in San Antonio and, and get this very honest sense that you gave to me of belonging. And you have no idea how important it is when you are an expat for years and you receive as a, as a gift the sense of belonging and you gave me that. You all gave me that in, uh, in San Antonio. So thank you for that. Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you both. Uh, as we, maybe we could push back Mr. Uh, uh, Bob Braubach's uh, introduction, if that's okay. He's having some technical issues uh, getting on. Uh, Francisco, if you don't mind, we could initiate that and, and, then, and then we could, uh, 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 include Bob when he's in. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's let's get started. All right. Well, I'll be off screen and um, and I will uh, connect. Oh, there he is. Speaking of the devil, he's he's trying. To <laughs> Perfect timing. Perfect timing. And Bob, if you could uh, unmute yourself when you're on, when you could hear us. Got it right there. Wonderful, Bob. And if you could turn your camera on as well, please. We'd love to see what you look like this morning. All right. There you go. There you go. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. Right. I'm going to jump right into it uh, to, uh, before Francisco starts the uh, moderating. Um, we just had a brief discussion, Bob, and um, I do want to thank you, Bob, for uh, your, if your ears weren't burning, we were talking very good things about you. And uh, we appreciate you for connecting us not only to uh, Ambassador Vooters, uh, but also uh, advocating for us internationally. Um, so without further uh, interruptions, I'm gonna introduce Francisco, who's gonna, he's going to uh, uh, start. And Bob, uh, I think there's a special presentation that the ambassador has before we get to Francisco. Yes, so. yes, thank you. Good morning and welcome. Uh, we're excited to have you on uh, Big Give 2020 here in support of the World Affairs Council of San Antonio. As all of you know, uh, World Affairs Council is a, a volunteer uh, community organization uh, that's dedicated to bringing the world to San Antonio and San Antonio to the world. And we are relying on your support today uh, as we wanna keep that important mission going. We're delighted to have with us uh, Ambassador Vooters uh, from the, the Kingdom of Belgium. And, and I'll look to the Honorary Consul of Belgium to San Antonio, Mr. Robert Brabach, to uh, formally introduce us to the ambassador and his credentials. Uh, Bob, I'll turn to you. Okay, okay. I think we're lucky to have the ambassador. He's a busy man. If you look at his credentials, it's pretty impressive. Uh, he has degrees from three or four different universities, uh, BA in law, BA in economics, uh, a degree from Geneva, an MS from the Economic uh, London School of Economics, and a Master's of Law from University of Louvain, the oldest university in Louvain, formed in 1425. Very impressive. Uh, and his credentials 
or impeccable, but I think as I pointed out yesterday at a consular conference, I think the key to the ambassador's success really is his ability to deal with people and his staff that he has are, are so efficient and, it, and uh, they all work in harmony as a team. And I think it's, it's really, it's not what you know, but it's how you deal with people. And I think if we can follow one example and learn from the ambassador, it's his ability to deal with people. And uh, I, I think that's, that's important wherever we go. Uh, the, the, uh, and, and you really don't need more of an introduction than that. If you look at what his role was in a negotiation of different treaties for the European Union, the largest trade and investment partner for the United States, uh, 27 member states, 447 million consumers. Belgium was a founding member in 1957. The headquarters of the European Union is in Brussels, Belgium, the capital of Belgium. And I think uh, uh, we also have the Eurozone, 19 member states who are a member of the Eurozone. Uh, so uh, that speaks for itself. And the Belgium is in the, the, the capital of Europe, really. Uh, I, and I think uh, that's why many US companies pick Belgium as its location for distribution manufacture and sale of goods because of its continental location and its easy access to the other member states on the continent. And so I think uh, uh, those I think are, or it's important to keep in mind, you also have NATO, uh, an important organization there, security organization next to the Brussels airport. Uh, so I think that's kind of the base ambassador I'd like to, some remarks I, I made in my introduction that kind of lay the predicate for your talk uh, and uh, why companies are moving to Europe and, and doing business there and why they pick Belgium for their its location. Uh, and uh, I, I think that's important to keep in mind. I think also the universities in Belgium are well recognized like Louvain, the oldest university in Belgium which has to be one of the oldest in Europe. And there are U US students that go there, uh, just like I did to the Free University of Brussels, where I got a master's in international law. So you can use those universities as an adjunct to, to a stepping stone to working and residing in Europe. And I think it's an important credential. And we need to keep education in mind because education is the key to our employment success. And uh, uh, I think uh, uh, the ambassador will be busy on, on some programs there at, at Louvain, uh, which will be important, uh, very important. So those are the few of the remarks I wanted to make to, to open up the discussion. Wonderful. Thank you, Bob. And, and Mr. Ambassador, I believe we have a surprise for Bob today. Have you planned a little something, sir? Uh, Francisco, yeah, and, uh, and thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you, Bob, for, uh, for your introductory words, your, um, your very wise and insightful talks already in the first, uh, first remarks. And, uh, and indeed, um, I have something for Bob Brabach, who is not, uh, he's our only consul in, in San Antonio since uh, for more than 25 years. He has become a very good personal friend and uh, I cherish his friendship. Uh, he con connected me in a very professional way, in a proactive way to your communities. And, uh, but above all, um, it's his service since 25 years in San Antonio, in Texas, that has, um, uh, let's say, prompted the Belgian government and the King of the Belgians to recognize his merits over all those years. And uh, I'm going to do something I've never done in my life, uh, but uh, that is to award a medal. We call it um, a decoration, an honorary decoration and, and, and a title, uh, which has been decided by the King of the Belgians for outstanding service by our friend, Bob Braubach, our Belgian honorary consul. 
Now, bear with me. Um, I will read the text and I will show you how the medal looks like. Uh, and then, of course, I will send everything over to you, Bob, to send to your office in San Antonio. That goes without saying. It was not possible. We would have loved uh, to award you this uh, medal in person, but as travel is a bit difficult, we couldn't do that. So, but I'm glad we can do it uh, on this occasion uh, of the organization of, uh, of this occasion that is presented to us. And the medal came in only tonight, tonight. So the timing couldn't be more perfect. <laughs> so uh, Francisco, if you, if you allow me, um, um, I would uh, like to read, and it's a bit formal, uh, the text of the honorary distinction, which reads that upon the pro proposal of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, upon the proposal of His Majesty the King Philip, the King of the Belgians, His Majesty has the honor to bestow in recognition of services rendered to Belgium with royal decree dated August 9, 2020, uh, the honorary distinction of officer in the order of Leopold II to Mr. Robert Braubach, Honorary Council of Belgium in San Antonio, United States. And it's signed by the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And so Bob, from the bottom of my heart, and not without emotion, I would like to, to honor you in front of your friends and show you uh, this, if you can see it on the screen, this is the medal, the medal you're going to get and you can wear it when, whenever you go on official, uh, official events in uh, San Antonio and beyond. So big congratulations, Bob. You've deserved it. Congratulations, Bob. Yeah. Th thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I really want to thank you for your support during my tenure and for this award. I'm honored to receive it, this award from the government of Belgium and particularly from you who I've enjoyed very much working with since you came in 2016. It's been a pleasure to work with you, your predecessors, all on our, all consuls for over 25 years to represent Belgium in San Antonio. It's a privilege and an honor. I, I value my relationship with you, with the, with the government, with the Belgian team. And for that, I thank you for this privilege. I thank you for the award. Yeah, I'm deep, deeply touched. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Bob, and thank yes. you for your service to San Antonio and really keeping that, that bridge uh, alive between San Antonio, Texas, and, and the, the Kingdom of Belgium and, and the people. Uh, and so, uh, Ambassador Ruders, without further ado, you know, for our audience at home, uh, folks would love to, to learn about you know, what in 2020 is the, the nature of that work relationship that all of you have worked so hard to build. Uh, of course, we are living in exciting times uh, between the coronavirus and, and uh, you know, many large global forces afoot. As Bob told us, uh, Belgium functionally and, and Brussels specifically is the capital of Europe, right? The, the seat of the, the European Union. And so uh, what do you think is kind of most present in mind and, and uh, would you like to share with our, our audience today? Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Francisco. Um, the, um, in, in, in my remarks uh, regarding your question, I would like to start with um, uh, my own experience uh, in diplomacy. I mean, the most recent one, I mean. Uh, and why is that? Uh, because <clears throat> I think that I've seen I've seen the, the work of a professional diplomat over the last four years, especially in the United States. It has been it has been changing, and uh, uh, I remember when I arrived in uh, in September 2016 in Washington. Uh, what struck me was that there was uh, ongoing dialogue and um, consultations between the then administration and a lot of partners around the world on issues like the Iran nuclear deal and uh, establishing bilateral relations with the United States and Cuba, for example, uh, climate change, uh, the Paris agreements and so on. 
And so that that was, and I, and I thought at the time, yes, this classic uh, traditional way of conducting diplomacy, people to people, talking to each other, consulting each other, uh, this was working and it worked <clears throat> until the, almost the last day, but that, my, my experience in Washington in um, it until January 2016. And then with all my colleagues in Washington, we were of course present for the inauguration of the 45th president uh, on the steps of um, of the Capitol Hill. And um, and, and there was, a, there was a, a, a speech that with a different uh, message um, uh, uh, to the world, uh, to the allies, and um, uh, and and it was a bit of a of a darker message, uh, I must say. And 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 we knew at the time that diplomacy would probably change a bit uh, over the over the years, which which it did. I mean, the traditional way of doing diplomacy where you consult through traditional uh, channels, the embassies, the capitals. Uh, you talk to NATO. You mentioned NATO. You uh, you talk to uh, you talk to the European Union. You United Nations Security Council, and you do it at both levels, organizations, and, and also bilateral with 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 the members of these organizations. But that that was a real a real strength of uh, the the American diplomacy. I mean, they were they were able to bring all the information together by by using the two levels. So. And that has changed a bit. And uh, for four years, I've experienced a, a bit of a new mentality. I mean, there's nothing unusual that that there is that there are changes in administration that happens in every country. And for diplomats, we're used to adjust to that. But here, there was this idea that um, uh, the president was of the opinion uh, that, uh, and that's still, the, and that's the case also in most of the administration today that the rest of the world had taken advantage of the United States and business terms, political terms, that the rest of the world and especially Europeans were not uh, paying enough for defense, uh, for, uh, for example, and security. And so um, it became, it became a, a different game, the game of diplomacy. We had to do it in a different way because we felt that the, um, the profession itself uh, as it was organized in a classical way, uh, could take a hit. And then also on top of that, and, and I think that's also for the World Affairs Council, not just in San Antonio, but around, around the country, I think it's a good subject that according to my knowledge of American foreign policy, <clears throat> there have been so many great traditions in American foreign policy. For example, the tradition of free trade. So. Uh, close to the heart of, of our friends in, in Texas, but also in Belgium. I mean, we are, we are probably with the Brits and the Dutch uh, and some others in, in the European Union, the most pro-free trade uh, country because we are so uh, so much open and we depend upon the, the business relationship with our neighbor. Not later than uh, two days ago, uh, my, my, my Dutch colleague drew my attention to the fact, for example, that the, um, the, the export of the Netherlands to Belgium is bigger, more important than the combined export of the Netherlands to China and the United States. Mm -hmm. Just to give you an idea that, I mean, in our part where we live for the world in Europe, it's, it's really, we're depending on each other and there is a, a big interdependence. And if we wouldn't have free trade, a free market, we would be probably in deep, in deep trouble. So, but uh, so free uh, free trade was certainly one of the traditional approaches in American foreign policy. The other one is, of course, the alliance working with uh, uh, with partners around the world. And um, and I've learned over the four, forty years that uh, building up uh, alliances and, and partnerships uh, is a, is a, an effort that cannot be re reduced to a subject of uh, the, 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 the taste of the day, uh, le goût du jour, as they say in French. Uh, so it takes time to invest. It's like, like personal friendships uh, and, uh, and, and working relations. So it, it takes time. And, and, and I'm sure that if, 
uh, in five years, of course, I will never wait five years. Um, I will <laughs> I will call on you. I know that that I I have a, such a good relationship with you guys, with Bob, and so many people in your community. That and and that's the result because we we have had these contacts in the past, and probably we trust each other. We know what you can ask, not ask, and so on. So so it cannot be reduced to just a one day thing. Um, and 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 so the, so that's another traditional approach in American foreign policy. Then there is a third dimension which uh, the rest of the world has always appreciated, which is uh, let's say the higher moral ground. I mean, trying to achieve in terms of ambition something that relates to let's say uh, higher causes, and then make an appeal to the rest of the world to join that higher cause. That also, and then of course um, another another dimension. So important i think also for texas and for san antonio is is the the regional approach so you try to do something special with your neighbors so canada and mexico uh, and so you so you have all these traditions american foreign policy and during my four years uh, I, I was i was kind of uh, let's say talking with my friends in the states say what's happening with these traditions and and of course, they recognized that they had to take some distance from these traditions. And then I asked, yes, but what do we replace that? What, what did you replace those traditions? I mean, with what? And, and, and I, asked, I asked that question uh, uh, recently, probably a bit more, because I was once in conversation with Henry Kissinger. And when I told, I mean, with Henry Kissinger, you have to have a conversation that is, uh, of course, at a very high level. And he drew my attention to the fact that in Europe, and especially in Western Europe, we may have a bit of a too, too much European-centric view of the world, and, and that uh, <coughs> maybe we should adjust it, because there are other parts of the world, in the, uh, in the Middle East, in the Arab countries, but also uh, in part of Asia. But maybe, uh, let's say, the the... the the, the perception and also the attitude towards the traditional American leadership has been replaced by something that uh, can be seen as a replacement of the traditional dimensions of uh, 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 the, or the, the traditions of American foreign policy. So, and uh, with uh, with uh, with a, 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 a let's say a, a political uh, feeling of sufficient comfort that that they think they have something new which the West Europeans or the Europeans do not ask of today. So, so I, I always found that extremely interesting uh, to follow during um, the last four years, these developments. And of course, diplomacy has, has um, been affected by a second uh, de uh, development you mentioned is the COVID, the health crisis, and it has been affected in many ways. Uh, and. And I think, I don't know how diplomacy will revert to the more classic, classical ways or the, the, the ways that we conducted diplomacy before COVID. I think there will be a natural ten tendency around the world uh, to go back to what we did before, but that will not be enough and we have to learn lessons and we have to realize that during the COVID, diplomacy, diplomatic output around the world has not been extremely successful. I mean, there have been uh, so many crises around the world. I mean, not many solutions. And there are so many issues we hoped that could be solved because of the health crisis that people would take a view of, okay, well, on this trade issue, maybe we should slow down and, and, and reverse the course. Or in that crisis in Syria, for example, for humanitarian reasons, because there is this health problem, we should allow for much more humanitarian access. And, and I can give a hundred examples, but it, they didn't come true. So I take a bit of a, of a, of a critical view of the, the, the art of diplomacy during the COVID. Of course, they did also positive things like evacuations of nationals uh, when they got stuck. Uh, uh, in, in faraway countries, I mean, the United States uh, undertook a great evacuation operation. Also, Belgium, for its own nationals, is probably the greatest evacuation operation since the Second World War, a civil evacuation operation. 
So, um, so I mean, it's not all. Uh, I mean, so, but that's um, that. These are my thoughts on uh, initial thoughts on diplomacy, and uh, maybe if if you agree, then further on, I can try to say how I, I try to navigate during this period as far as the bilateral relationship is concerned between the United States and, and Belgium, and uh, and and try to make uh, to develop them further in this new context that I described. Um, Mr. Ambassador, kind of ju jumping in with some questions already emerging. Uh, you talked a lot about the profession of diplomacy. What led you to a life as an ambassador? Uh, what was the, the professional path to becoming an ambassador? And uh, what have you discovered that is not at all what you expected? Uh, when you when you made that original set of choices, yeah. Well, uh, I became a diplomat uh, more than forty years ago, <laughs> and we have a, a system of uh, career diplomats, not political appointees in in Belgium. I think the two systems have advantages, disadvantages. <clears throat> One advantage I see in the American system is that every every four year you get you inject a lot more. A lot more, I think, energy because it's a one in a lifetime opportunity for a, an American ambassador as a political appointee to go to another country and just give it. So we have to spread the effort over 40 years. I mean, uh, and it's uh, uh, it's a different, but still, um, uh, what prompted me? Well, um, I had a, I had a, I belong to a generation that. I think like Bob Brabax that had an interest. He came to Europe. I mean, I want to go to the United States. I wanted to study at an American university. And I, I, I got stuck at the London School of Economics, but I, I mean, I wanted to, uh, and we believed in causes. We believed, we had, our generation believed in good causes and we wanted to do something. It was the beginning of the green movement in Europe. It was, uh, it's not that I was uh, especially passionate, but it was the beginning of opening markets. It was the, but was still the Cold War at the same time. And the Cold War at least had the advantage that uh, you could see uh, and predict and learn about behavior of states. And, and that, was, that was when I became a diplomat and experienced it during my first years, the Cold War, that was really true. I mean, we knew how within the alliance around the United States, what we could expect in that group and we knew what we could expect for example from russian behavior i think much more than today so uh, uh, now what i didn't realize uh, as a diplomat uh, when i entered the diplomatic career is that you you can uh, i was going to touch on so many different issues so one day you're dealing with uh, let's say police issues. The other day you have to negotiate a European constitution uh, as a diplomat, and then you have to do economic diplomacy, and then you have to assist Belgians or Americans who are looking for a visa, who are in trouble, and so a very, very, very personal and very important process. Then you have to, uh, I don't know, to evacuate. So, um, but everything that um, I've seen happening in terms of output could probably never have happened without the personal relationships that have been mature. I mean, they have to be mature, of course, uh, without, uh, so every good thing that I've seen coming out is a lot of personal relationships. I can give you many examples, for example, in trade. Uh, I mean, I've, I've a long time, the um, conclusion of trade agreements between the United States, Europe, and many other partners around the world were only possible because the trade negotiations had so such personal uh, relationship and they could organize the negotiation in such a way that uh, they said, well, uh, I really need this. So on your side, could you could you pro please pass on this message so that we can get where we want and then I will do something for you. And I went to, 
they went to each other's houses and there, there was more of this interpersonal relation, which I think is, is, uh, is important. So, uh, so the diversity of the activity was maybe something I didn't expect. And the importance um, of the personal relationship is something that I learned a lot about or the importance about. Yeah. That's, that's wonderful, Mr. Ambassador. And, and I'll tell you, you know, it's a great opportunity to, to shift our focus to talk a little bit about the 2016 uh, trade mission that, that you led of, of Belgian leaders to the United States, including a visit to San Antonio. Uh, as you're talking about relationship and the importance of it, uh, you, you couldn't be speaking more to the heart of the city and the culture that is San Antonio. Uh, I often tell folks that move from other, you know, even uh, uh, Americans that move from other cities to San Antonio, that in San Antonio, relationship is the coin of the realm. Here, everything operates based on, on uh, who you know, what you know about them, and, and breaking bread at one another's homes. Uh, and so that's essential to us. You actually have a number of personal friendships here in San Antonio, separate and apart from your official duties, uh, and that have kept you coming back to our city over the years. Tell us a little bit about that, that mission in 2016 and, and what your own experience as a, a friend in the world of San Antonio, Texas has been. Yes, when I arrived, of course, the decision to, to come to Texas and San Antonio had uh, been taken, but it was, of course, the was a lot of work to to make it a success, uh, especially when uh, when I started my own preparation. There was uh, there were not many companies on the list, and then eventually we arrived with probably too many, more than two hundred, and and uh, we ended up with with I think uh, in terms of output, uh, twenty contracts. That was both business to business as as university, university and business to university. So there was a bit of everything in the, out, in the output, uh, but output gives legitimacy to your action. And, uh, and so um, uh, I, I invest a lot, but I mean, it's, it's the best thing that happened to, during my four years. Uh, the most uh, rewarding, I would say. And um, and I, and I think it's a, it's a fantastic tool that you can, so we, in a structured way, and then of course with the, the, uh, uh, being gifted by a lot of hospitality, of course, but in a structured way, you can come to another country and, and try to organize business to business, business to government, and then see where the matches are. Uh, I think it's, it's one, and then having a royal princess, I mean, not many people knew what a princess is exactly, but okay, we, I, <coughs> I think they know now what a princess can do, member of the royal family. <laughs> and, uh, and then <coughs> we, um, uh, we uh, the, the welcome was extraordinarily warm. And, uh, and I think there was also a good basis for, uh, that was a good foundation for follow-up, which is more important. And also after this big party left San Antonio and Texas, uh, we came back and other people came back. And I know that there are many new contracts after that were also made. So I think it's, um, it's useful. It's heavy as a tool, but it's useful. And I think it was uh, successful. And I, I thank all the, I thank Bob Braba, I thank all the people who are involved in the, in the, the San Antonio visit. Um, and I learned a lot about San Antonio and I'm continuing, I will continue to work on the relationship but I will never be able to do it with, uh, with Braubach. Um, just to give a few examples, eh? uh, if, if I may, which have nothing to do with the economic mission but just about the kind of links you can uh, relate. So. Uh, I think Bob Braubach, that was before I arrived, he, he, he fixed or arranged, let's say, agreement between, trade agreement between the San Antonio Chamber of Congo, uh, Commerce and, uh, and the city of Ghent. He's, um, he's uh, I mean, there's nobody who promotes more and I support him there 
let's say, the sport relationship between San Antonio and Belgium, of course, uh, the Spurs are not very far in this uh, way, <laughs> in this approach, and, and, uh, and, and that, that's very good, but also tennis. Uh, I think sports remains a very good, a very good tool for, uh, for diplomacy to bring people together. And it's maybe not the biggest business, but I wouldn't underestimate it. I mean, if one day Texas would host Olympics, Olympic Games, my God, you will have a lot of business, I can tell you. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and also uh, in the academic field, it was not business, but ac academics. So uh, Bob Brobach is, is trying to, um, to set up uh, a relationship or an agreement between uh, the university he mentioned, so the Catholic University of Leuven, and also the Mays Cancer Center. And, and, I'm, and I've been in, uh, in contact with uh, people in your community to help me set up, which has happened in the meantime, an uh, America European Foundation, again at this University of Leuven. So uh, we will continue to build on that. Then there are some contacts that Bob already has uh, organized in my future life with, uh, with uh, Texas University of, of San Antonio, which, by the way, is uh, one of the great universities when it comes to cybersecurity. And we can learn a lot because it's of cybersecurity research and, and uh, also practical knowledge. Uh, we are a bit behind in Europe uh, compared to America. So, Mr. Ambassador, if I could ask you to, to dig in there a little bit, what were some of the impressions, right, when, when you all came in 2016 and, and since certainly San Antonio has been working very hard on the cybersecurity front, uh, also in the biomedical technology research and development fronts, uh, you know, we work very hard at, at all layers of the city to really uh, uh, equip San Antonio to be a world-class city and join the community of, of metropolitan leaders uh, at a global level. But we, you know, there's a saying, the fish doesn't know that it's wet. We can't see ourselves the way that others see us. So, so when you, other European leaders come and spend time in San Antonio, what notes jump out at you? What are the things that you, you think are uh, worthwhile that we should uh, continue to invest in and push because they are valuable to others beyond our own community? and our bridge to potential future ties culturally, investment and otherwise. What do you think we have, are the best things we have going for us that you would encourage us to continue to invest in? Well, during my, my stay in the United States, it's only four years, Francisco, but uh, I, I, I went, uh, I, I undertook uh, every year on, a, on average 15 shorter economic missions, myself, and outreaching and so a bit of <clears throat> everywhere. And when I look back on this rather intense uh, activity, I must say that if I would have to, to choose the two or three places where I think for a, 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 a foreigner, uh, it's the easiest, the easiest and the most accessible to do business, I would choose Texas and of course, including San Antonio region, and second, probably the Southeast. So everything that's going on around uh, Atlanta, it's also very dynamic. And these would, in my mind, I mean, to, to my sense, but who am I? I'm not a businessman, I'm a diplomat. But that was what I, what I felt. So this is, this is something, uh, if you confirm that it, it's true also for an American businessman, not just for a foreign businessman, that these are the two places where it's easiest uh, and more, most productive. Then, of course, you have something to offer and to develop and to let the world know and, and, and so on. So, um, second, of course, <clears throat> I think it's it's important not just to, let's say, take in uh, what comes from outside of San Antonio, but San Antonio probably has to also go out and 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 let its uh, its um, its region and its strength known to the rest of the world. I, I don't think that enough people, for example, you mentioned cybersecurity, biotech. Maybe San Antonio is not the first city <coughs> that 
a broad people would mention when they talk about these two important sectors. But I know in the meantime, and we know <laughs> that, that these are really, uh, uh, I mean, very, very well advanced in terms of research uh, the, and the relationship between university and business, with the military and so on. So there you have something, but you have to go out. So the more that the governor, the mayor, I mean, your community can go out and make a trip to Europe, make a trip to Belgium, to the UK, the Netherlands, France, or Germany. Uh, I think, uh, I know it's not, not easy to set up these trips, but I, you have all the resources to do it, I'm sure. So that would also be part of my, my modest answer to your uh, big question. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and maybe also uh, the third thing is um, having a kind of re reflection how COVID will affect the different sectors and then anticipate. So it's clear to me, for example, just to illustrate my point, that um, as technology does not know any border, it's clear that a lot of virtual work will go on uh, and travel. I'm sure that once travel becomes possible, the, the travel of private passengers will boom again. Whereas business, I think, will not will never be the same level as before because business is learning how to do the virtual work. Um, I think also in the financial, the banking sector, um, the COVID, uh, the impact of COVID on, let's say, the the global networks and on banking financial service uh, deserve. And then also, I would certainly, uh, I think this is important to look at the effects of COVID on, on society and the groups that are more vulnerable because they don't have all the opportunities in the education sector. Uh, what I'm afraid of a bit is when I go around these days and I talk to a lot of people is that uh, and it's also valid for Washington. So, for example, in the communities uh, where uh, where there are less opportunities for education, they're falling very far behind. It is, it is like the education is falling into a big COVID hole. Hmm. So, and I think it's about if you all want to go forward with the same opportunities, this. Um, then one has to address that problem also to um, uh, get your society, your communities to keep the strengths that you already have and not become weaker because there are parts of the population that fall or risk to fall in this big COVID hole in the education sector. That's wonderful. Mr. Ambassador, one more question as we're coming up on time. You're in that spirit of what you were talking about, that people-to-people -people contact. We have some wonderful organizations here in town. We have Summer of Service and Amir Samandi that, that take school kids on, on trips around the world and, and other great organizations that the World Affairs Council works closely with. You know, in that spirit, it's so easy. You know, Last year, I had the opportunity to, uh, to work on the mayor's uh, airport strategy task force, where they're trying to create more uh, air links between San Antonio and parts of the world. And we have a growing base of San Antonians visiting Europe and other international destinations. But how do you get beyond the Disneylandification of global capitals, right? If you're a San Antonian and you want to have real people to people contact with the people of Belgium, what advice would you give us to, to actually connect with the people and not just the tourist locales. I can arrive in Brussels, I can have a wonderful waffle on the plaza in front of the palace, but that doesn't mean I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a friend in Belgium. What advice would you give to us as San Antonians to really make those people to people links when we go abroad in the world? My short answer, dear Francisco, is create a World Affairs Council in Belgium. We don't have it. And <laughs> Bob, that's, that's your next assignment. Yes. 
I, I think it's a wonderful organization. I mean, to, to try to connect the global to, to the local. I mean, it's one, and uh, I'm really, uh, I'm really in awe. Uh, and uh, and I think in Europe we should have the same. We don't have it. We don't have it. And I'm sure that if you would have, I mean, the connections would come probably people to people that are really important. And I, of course. I think we have to look also at the younger people and do probably a bit more um, to the extent possible. And when, um, let's say, the academic offer can, um, um, the academic offer and is uh, kind of stabilize itself. We are still, I mean, all the the the, the, the deans of the universities and they are still thinking a lot of stress. What am I going to do in the next uh, next five years? Is it, on, is it the hybrid? Is it uh, only physical, only online? Combination of that, and 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 how am I going to reach out to other universities? I think there will be um, yeah, there will be um, uh, some important uh, reflection. I think new orientations, but I would jump on the wagon of exchange of students. I would just uh, well, it was tonight. I was making a list, for example. It's a very practical thing of everything that the University of Leuven in Belgium is offering to uh, American students in, uh, um, in the different disciplines. So possibilities, you, so you study here in the United States, you want to go to Europe, what are the offers? Uh, that's people to people. That's at the level of the young people. So, so um, I think you can do it. But first of all, this World Affairs Council in Belgium, I mean, and, and uh, that's, that's the way to go, I think. But you have to speak to the, the higher management, I think. Sure. Well, perhaps you can arrange an audience for us with the king, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. Uh, <laughs> no, yeah. Uh, Ambassador what, Bruders, what, what a delight. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, of course, to your service to the people of Belgium, but through that, your friendship and service to the people of San Antonio and the people of the United States. It's these kinds of relationships uh, that, that really make this global community worth being a part of and, and look forward to, uh, to enjoying a, a beer with you next time you're here in town visiting your friends in San Antonio. Uh, Armin, I'll turn it back to you to, to close us out. You know, I, I, I heard, I heard uh, a World Affairs Council in Belgium and I, I know Patricia's listening to this, so I, I think we may have to work on that. And, uh, uh, you know, may maybe we need a satellite office in Brussels. There you go. I want to thank the ambassador. Thank you so much for your time and, and, and you, for being so generous with your availability. Uh, it has been an, an honor and, and a, a wonderful opportunity to get to know you these, this past year. Uh, Francisco, you're awesome. You're amazing. Please look him up. He, he doesn't like it, but... Uh, I want you to go and check out his website. Uh, he does some great coaching and and uh, uh, and strategizing for for profits, nonprofits. Uh, he's he's a he's an admirable guy and a stand up guy, and I appreciate him for serving on our board. Um, Bob Browback, congratulations! What a great recognition. Um, uh, a true uh, above, service above self uh, individual. Uh, for getting this award and for being so active in the community as an honorary consul to Thank you, Armin. Thank you. We're, lu we're lucky to have the ambassador. One thing he didn't point out, he's also a marathon runner and a mountain climber and has a lot of recognition in that area. Just wow. don't overlook that. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, I know we've been getting a lot of uh, positive comments on social media. And by the way, the, the belt, whoever's does your social media ambassador. They're doing a great job. They updated it. They, they promoted this event. So thank you to your team who is doing that. Uh, thank you all of you. And thank you for giving me the opportunity for dialogue and the feeling of belonging, because I think these are really important. And, uh, and on that basis, I'm sure that we can continue to do great things together. And I uh, uh, I thank Fran uh, Francisco in particular because uh, uh, I was looking forward to this event and uh, it really gives such satisfaction and that is 
thanks to you. And I have to say, we didn't have a fire drill, uh, but it's, it's, it's raining like hell here in Washington. I'm looking out of the window. <laughs> so I have enough water at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for your friendship. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, yeah. I will see you at Rotary. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all have a good one. Thank you, both. Yes, All right.